bit where justice is the focus. It's really easy to think of all the scenarios that might happen. But the problem is that we gave you the most realistic scenario. That when your family member is currently under harm, when he could be killed at any moment, you're not going to think rationally, you're not going to think about upholding any principles of justice in the judiciary system, even if they might claim that it's important. Because the most urgent matter at hand there is protecting that person. And that's when justice comes in. Because when justice doesn't protect the person straight away, and when it actually causes more duress instead of solving duress, then justice is delayed and justice doesn't work. And that's a principle that we stood by in all three speakers and something that they haven't dealt with. So three points of contention today. Firstly, is allowing ransom really going to be immoral? Secondly, who is able to give more leverage to the with criminals? And finally, who, which side actually pushes families to take more desperate measures? Or which side actually allows for the cooperation between the police and the people to improve? We think of course that our time. So let's look at the first point of contention. Is allowing ransom going to be correct? But before I move on, yes. I'm sorry, but we've given you two responses to this. And firstly, there was entire substantive was that, well, it's already recognized as a mitigating factor. That's how you distinguish manslaughter from something such as murder. And how do you differentiate um, the harm? We only think that because of the fact that this is a mitigating factor throughout every circumstance, uh, every every single circumstance. Then it's a law that is irrelevant and it's something they haven't dealt with. On the issue of terrorist organizations, we see that once you pay the ransom, it doesn't stop there. Because obviously the person is still guilty of kidnapping and obviously there still needs to be a person who is protected. So the police force members are obviously going to pursue the criminal otherwise. And we don't think that in as in a murder, where the harm is definitely already afflicted and is afflicted straight away, the terrorist organization will definitely benefit straight away. So we don't think <coughs> that an entire parallel actually comes out. So moving on to my point of contention proper, is allowing ransom principally correct? And the first thing they told us was that it's an affirmation of criminal acts. No, as we told you in all three speakers, and especially in Daryl, what we're saying is that ransom is a means to an end, that you use it to achieve the greater good. And this is the greater good that they stand for, that sometimes you have to compromise on small ideals to ensure that you serve what's more important. And that's what we also stand for, right? That perhaps it's not right to use guns in certain circumstances, but the police force uses it anyway, because it's the most practical solution in order to obtain the justice. That is something that is also meaningful. And the secondly, that justice only works insofar that it protects the welfare and interests of the people. As I stated in my preamble, justice is going to be delayed. And we also think that the judiciary system is going to fail because there's more behind to cause the people. Because ransom might have actually saved the person faster if you pay in certain scenarios. And that makes it much easier for the people to get rid of, to actually gain that emotional closure, closure that we Remember, we're talking about the police force who's actually assigned to protect neighborhoods. By that principle, it also stands on the principle of protecting individuals more than perhaps protecting the judiciary system. What they use it is as, is as a framework, and that's not the main draw. So moving on from that, let's look at the whole idea of unintended harm once again. Right? Before you really dealt with this, there are about for you that is a mitigating factor that it applies in all cases that is irrelevant. This is something that they haven't dealt with. What we said is that in many cases, such as um, Somalia, the examples they brought for us, Al Qaeda, these happen in cases where there is no established police force, where the police force is not trained to deal with these certain scenarios, and obviously that's why they will fail. And in all of these reasons, we think that it's not only because it's not a dichotomy between saving one individual versus saving collective society. Because as we've proven, it doesn't do anything to collective society cannot prove that it always benefits terrorist organizations. And if you're going to implement this law, then everybody who is kidnapped is going to have their welfare, welfare compromised. And we think that is definitely harm that's done on a much greater level to lots of people. So that's something that we can say. So for we agree that ransom therefore is principally correct, let's look at my second point of contention. Who is able to gain more leverage in dealing with criminals? And we've really given you two very strong points of analysis. Firstly, even if 45% of criminals still kill their, uh, their hostages, we think that these criminals will be dealt with. Anyway, we think those people would have killed in any circumstance. 
But we have to examine this all these data. The psyche of every criminal. That some people do it because they're cowards, and some people do it for the money. As long as there are a group of people, then ransom should be at least one tool to ensuring that we can get what we want. And therefore, we need to preserve that measure. And then secondly, if criminals see that ransom is going to be harder if we actually assume that, then criminals are going to push the burden even further. They're going to torture the victims even more to ensure that their family will be even more under duress, so the family will still be more willing to gain their ransom. Why will criminals do this? It won't be deterred because by the very fact that they are criminals and carry out these kinds of things that cause harm, it means they think that they are already above the law, that they can get away with whatever they want. And that's why they're not going to listen to anything that the law states, especially if they're doing it because of the fact that they want to go against the law. Secondly, what we've got for to do is that the police force is already trained to negotiate with these kinds of individuals. And that's why the people trust the police force in this circumstance. Because of the fact that the police can uh, manipulate these criminals into actually giving concessions. Remember what we said that this is only a coup and that it ensures that people keep working with the police because at least the police can show them that they understand and they keep their option open. The last thing, right? Which side pushes families to more desperate measures? And they completely ignore Elvis' subject that the police force is only going to work on the basis that the people trust them, that the people also trust that the judiciary system is doing something for them. But when they see the ransom is delayed, and when they see that the police force cannot address their most immediate concern, then these people aren't going to regard the law as something that is very important anymore because of the fact they want to prioritize a life and death situation. Because of the fact that they're not making a rational decision, as I said in my preamble, which was what Daryl set up right in for a speaker. That when the judiciary system doesn't look after these people anymore, then this reputation is going to be something that is completely in the ivory tower.